All right, all right. Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing great on this Sunday evening, getting ready for a big, busy week. Some of you who are watching may already be in next week, Monday. Regardless, I hope the time change treated you well. This is the most difficult day of the year to get up. We don't go to work on Sundays, fortunately. That's why we do the time change Sunday morning, as we do, so we don't have to worry about it on a working or a school day. But it makes getting up on Sunday morning very, very difficult. And this morning, I was up at 5, so I lost, well, I lost the hour of sleep. I basically didn't sleep last night. This is pretty much how the spring forward time has always gone for me. Uh, and I feel like all of my students from this week were saying the same thing. Um, looks like everything's good where we are. If you look at this up in the corner, right there, this little map, if you scan the QR code, you're able to enter your location. And what you would do is you would just scan the QR code and it will pull up the map. And if you're on a phone, the most difficult thing to do is select the right spot, but you get more than one try. So poke the map until you get a pin that's close enough to where you want it to be here. If I expand this a little bit for you, I keep meaning to add an animation to this and I just keep forgetting each week. Next week, next week I'll do it. Next week I can do it. But if you take a look at it, you can see there are a few pins on it. Somebody lives out in the ocean I'm guessing they're from Argentina or they're from Brazil. I'm not entirely sure, but you can see where people are from as they watch the stream. Uh, I use this in my classes to log where people are coming from so they can see who lives in the area. It doesn't have your name. There's no information taken. The pins are completely anonymous. Nobody will know who you are. Nobody can find you. But it's a fun way to know where people are joining us from. This will always be up in the corner. Again, I want an animation that brings it from here to here, or maybe even it pulls it over into the middle. But I just, I, you know, I'm one person, and I stay pretty busy throughout the week. So I'll get this at some point. You know what else I forgot? My firelight. You know, if I seem like I'm a little bit scatterbrained tonight, Time change, <laughs> time zone change. Um, everyone in class gets really anxious about the first week of the time zone change because the US and a few other countries change time zones. You can look it up on Wikipedia. There's a very good map that shows the time zone changes around the world, and it makes it very easy to understand who changes when. Like Central Europe, most countries, I can say for sure Italy, Pretty sure Germany's included. They all change on March 31st. So to compound how different, how difficult this is, students will have classes tomorrow, and their classes are going to be an hour earlier in their time, or now, for maybe two or, well, what is it? For two weeks, for about two weeks, going on three. And then their time will change again when their time zone change, change occurs. So we always have so many questions um, coming through our help and support line uh, with English at the ready. The best I can do right now. I don't have my, my title for English at the ready set up yet, but it's in the bottom corner. About where my finger is, if you can imagine me reaching through this board here, about right there. Um, it's, it's just a challenge. I've answered probably 20 questions already today, and I guarantee you tomorrow before classes, I'll have more questions about, teacher, what time is my class? Eastern Standard Time, always Eastern Standard Time. I used to try to change time zones for people and try to change classes, but it, it just causes so much scheduling drama. It makes it really difficult to bring people back together into a, a schedule that works. There's always someone or people, usually it's more than one person, it's people that can't find a good time that's available for classes, and you end up losing, you know, a good group of students just because of time changes. So we go by Eastern Standard Time now, which is now Eastern Daylight Time. That's another confusion. A lot of people don't know what to call this time of year. It's Daylight Savings Time. And if you say EST, people still know the region of the world you're talking about, the time zone you're talking about. But as a technicality, and some people are really serious about this, as a formality even, 
Eastern Daylight Time, EDT, Eastern Daylight Savings Time. This is what we'll call it formally. Again, if you ask somebody on the street, they'll probably say, oh, Eastern Standard Time is my time zone. They may say, we're observing Daylight Savings Time now. But I think most people, most people I've come across, and most people I hear talk about it, Eastern Standard Time changes. We spring forward and we fall back. Anyway, this week, the weekly roundup, 3-10-2024. This phrase is one that I use a lot, this idiom. This made me think about quite a few things that I added to a video lesson for our English at the Ready classes for this week. It was a big inspiration for what I decided to do um, with our masterclass, with our video lessons at the end of the week. The meaning, it's used to show that the following description is part of a larger whole. So when you put something in a nutshell, a nutshell is very small. Think about a peanut, even a walnut, which is a big nut. It's still a small nutshell to us. When you put your words in a nutshell, you're summarizing something. You're saying it in the simplest words you can. But you'll notice this has an ellipsis at the end. If you don't know what an ellipsis is, it's the three dots. And an ellipsis shows a continuation. It means something will follow this idiom to bring my thought to completion. For example, in a nutshell, comma, I work as an online English teacher. This is what I tell people when they ask, Jacob, Rice JD, what do you do? What is your job? I'm an online English teacher, in a nutshell. And you can say it that way, or you can say, in a nutshell, I'm an online English teacher. Either way is going to make sense to people. But again, what I'm saying when I say in a nutshell to add some context to this is my job is primarily an English teacher online. I teach people, I train people, I coach people to speak English better. But that doesn't include this stream. That doesn't include creating the lessons, all the content creation that I do for not just content creation for streaming, for YouTube, for Instagram, or wherever else. Content creation for classes. All of the classes for each week, I have to create at some point or another. That's one masterclass, two video lessons, and then regular course material, along with at least two, we'll call them deliverables. Two things for students to work on, or two things that are images that show or describe some English concept we're working on that week. And then you have your sales side, you have your marketing side, all of this in a nutshell. Not everybody needs to know all the details of what I do or of what you do. So you can say, in a nutshell, this is what I do. I'm trying to get myself more in the center of my open space here. I hate covering up my little fireplace back here though, because I, I think that light makes it nice and cozy in here. But if I sit over here, it's like I'm eating this board. I'll get used to it eventually. Oops. The second example, give me a description of the new project in a nutshell. I don't want to know everything. I don't have a lot of time. I'm a busy professional boss. Give me a description of the new project in a nutshell. So what this made me think about were signaling phrases. Because when I say, in a nutshell, you know, or I'm telling you, that what comes next is going in the nutshell. What comes next, in a nutshell, comma, this is going to be a summary. In a nutshell, I'm not telling you everything. So that can signal you to know that there's more. You can ask questions about it. Or you can just say, okay, this is a summary, and accept that and move on, right? Signaling phrases in English are words or phrases used to show a particular function or purpose within a conversation, speech, or piece of writing. So it's used in conversation, talking to each other, 
and in writing. When you write it, often, but not always, you'll add a comma. In a nutshell, comma. And for many signaling phrases, you'll do that. It's a, you can call it a writing signal as well. This is not technical textbook English, what I'm saying, but the comma often signifies this is a signaling phrase. And what follows it, because the comma separates it, what follows it is the important part. It's the summary. These phrases help to guide the listener or reader through the conversation, signaling transitions and important details. So again, it signals, it highlights, it lets you know. Think of a signal like a lighthouse. A lighthouse has a big beam of light, a big, a long beam of light that let ships know that the rocks nearby are dangerous. It lets them know that they need to be careful in the waters close to the lighthouse. It's a signal. Think about, let's go nerdy here. Think about Lord of the Rings and the beacons of Gondor, right? They light the beacons to let Rohan know they need help. So it's a signal, hey, whoa, we're in trouble. We need help. So these signaling phrases highlight transitions, and important details in conversation or in writing. They play a crucial role in clearly communicating your thoughts and opinions to your audience. These are advanced skills to learn. Using signal phrases correctly, understanding them. First, you have to understand the idiom. If that phrase is an idiom, it's not always an idiom. Some signal phrases, um, signaling phrases are additionally. Additionally, so you know Additionally, comma, what I'm about to say, additionally, comma, adds to what we're talking about. Additionally, comma, signals you to know there's more adding to what's already been said. So some of them are very simple to understand, but words, phrases, like in a nutshell, you have to understand what that means first, right? Sometimes signaling phrases are idioms. From our classes at English at the Ready, again, I need my, my graphic for English at the Ready. This is uh, what we call spicy vocabulary. These idioms as signaling phrases are very, very strong additions to your speech. They show that you understand the idiom, but also you understand how to use it to highlight what you're talking about in your sentences and communications. So a few that we've talked about, bite the bullet, you're going to be fine. Bite the bullet. And bite the bullet means that you accept the difficulty, you accept the challenge, and you're going to meet it head on. Think about the movie, The Matrix. In The Matrix, lots of bullets are flying. Neo is, he's dodging all the bullets. And I could be making this up, but I'm fairly certain at one point, he grabs a bullet. He doesn't catch it in his teeth. There are some old films, some old cowboy films, where uh, one of the main characters would catch a bullet in his teeth, bite the bullet, meet that challenge head on. Don't run away from those challenging you. You hit the nail on the head. That answer was correct. You hit the nail on the head. You're hammering a nail into a board. Think about you're a roofer or you're a carpenter and you're hammering the nail. You have the tip or the point of the nail on one end and the other end has this round area where you hit with the hammer. That's called the nail head or the head of the nail. So hit the nail on the head means you're accurate. You're on point. It's like saying you've hit the bullseye. You hit the nail on the head. That answer was correct. You hit the nail on the head. The next thing I'm going to say is about being accurate. It has to do with accuracy. Don't worry about the exam. It'll be a piece of cake. Don't worry about the exam. It'll be a piece of cake. That exam's going to be so easy. Don't worry about it. It's a piece of cake. You're going to do great. Signals that what I'm about to say is going to be very easy. It's a piece of cake. You're going to do great. Don't worry about it. Everyone is trying the new diet, so I guess I'll jump on the bandwagon too. Jump on the bandwagon. 
This one, I always think about old cowboy films because you had the gang of bad guys who would come into town on a wagon, calling it a bandwagon, right? If you jump on the bandwagon, you're in a group or you're doing the same thing as other people in your group. So everyone is trying the new diet, so I guess I'll jump on the bandwagon too. Spill the beans, spill the beans. We're telling secrets now. When you spill the beans, you're telling a secret. This could be, it's usually not a big secret. It's not a friendship ending secret, it can be. But spilling the beans is often accidental. You'll often see, I accidentally spilled the beans. I accidentally told them that we're going on this big trip in the summer. My kids are excited now, and they're going to be asking questions about this until we leave. So parents, when parents spill the beans, it often causes a lot of trouble for parents. I know three kids, if I tell my kids we're going somewhere or doing something, I'll never hear the end of it. They'll ask question after question after question. That's interesting. And the last one, he's burning the midnight oil. He's burning the midnight oil. He's staying up late. He's working late. It's late at night before we had electricity and electric lamps, electric lights and light bulbs. We had oil lamps. So you used oil to keep the lamp burning late into the night, late past midnight. He's burning the midnight oil. He's burning the midnight oil. I'm certain he will finish the project on time. So again, we're signaling that he's staying up late. And I know that because he's staying up late, he's going to finish this project on time. I'm not worried about him. All right. And just a few other idioms we talked about this week in a pickle and in hot water. In a pickle means to be in a little trouble or troublesome situation. Think about pickles and how you take a cucumber and you drop it in a pickling jar with vinegar. It's like you have been picked up and you've been dropped in that pickling jar in the vinegar. Vinegar is acidic, so it's going to burn a little bit, be a little bit uncomfortable, tingle, be a little strange. It's troublesome, uncomfortable. Now, if you're in hot water, you're going to boil. Think about a lobster. You can put a lobster in vinegar for a little while and I mean, it more or less will be okay. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's not a humane or kind thing to do, but if you put it in hot water, that's it. <laughs> that lobster's done and it's going to be cooked and placed on the dinner table. Um, so in hot water is a degree worse. It's not just troublesome or a little trouble, it's big trouble. For example, my mom told me I was in hot water. Whoa, sorry, mom, <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. What am I in trouble for? You're in hot water means you're in big trouble. My mom told me I was in a pickle. This is not something that we would say. We would not say my mom told me that we we're in a pickle. Uh, my mom told me I was in a pickle. They wouldn't, we wouldn't say this. It would have, it would sound weird and not really have much meaning. Mom might tell you that you're in a pickle if you forget your wallet at home, or maybe, I don't know, you leave your homework at home so you can't turn it in at school that day. Maybe you're in a pickle there. Just a little trouble, not usually a big deal. But if you're in hot water, maybe you don't want to come home and see your mom <laughs> because maybe there's going to be a big trouble, right? Maybe you'll be grounded. You know, if your mom believes in whoopings, as we call them, Spankings, yeah, a little bit of physical discipline where they apply the hand to the backside, you know. So in hot water, a little more serious, a little bit more severe than in a pickle. And the last one we'll talk about is just another idiom that has to do with nuts. We talked about food idioms in classes this week. A hard nut to crack. A hard nut to crack is something or someone that is difficult to understand or solve. A hard nut to crack. This could be a math problem. Maybe this math problem is 
a hard nut to crack. It's a difficult problem to understand. I feel like programmers, computer science problems, often can be hard nuts to crack because they can be complex. They take a lot of special expertise to understand what's going on with them and how to answer them, how to respond to them. For example, learning, learning the piano has been a hard nut to crack for Sarah, but she is determined to master it. Her stubbornness made her a hard nut to crack, but eventually she opened up about her feelings. I'd ask you, are you a hard nut to crack? Are you someone who's very open about the way they feel? Are you very forthcoming with your emotions and your feelings? I don't think that I am. I think that I'm a fairly hard nut to crack because I've lived in Argentina, I've lived in China, I've had lots of experiences where I've been very much alone and I've had to deal with situations by myself without someone else helping me or without someone who can speak my language helping me um, and someone I can't speak to well enough in their language, which is my own fault, right? But I feel like that's made me more of a hard nut to crack over the years. Uh, maybe when I was younger, I was a bit more of an open book. Here's another idiom. Uh, you're an open book, or he was, she was, or she is an open book. When I was younger, I think I was an open book. I would tell you how I felt, and most people knew, Jake likes this, Jake doesn't like this, you know, Jake wants to do this, Jake wants to do that. Now, I don't feel like most people I interact with on a daily basis really know what I'm thinking, <laughs> which, you know, it, it's good and bad. It's good because it keeps people on their toes, I feel like, and I do like that. But it's bad because maybe it stops me from making deeper or creating deeper relationships with people. Think about it that way. Sometimes a hard nut to crack is also a difficult nut to get to know. And of course, in this case, you are the nut. That object you're talking about, that thing, that person, is the nut, a tough nut to crack. But when you crack it, sometimes you find some really interesting things inside. Then again, you might say, if I crack the nut, maybe I don't want to know what's inside of that nut. I bet you can all think of an example of someone or some situation, some nut, that you just don't want to crack. Leave that nut hole, put it away. If it's a coconut, throw it back out to sea. We didn't say what kind of nut it is. Walnut, coconut, peanut, cashew nut, you name it. It could be any kind of nut. But we had some great conversation about this this week and people gave some really good advice. We had a couple of students who were going through some hard times with building relationships and they would say, I think uh, I'm a hard nut to crack teacher. And, you know, I try not to give a lot of advice in my class, but what I love to see is another English learning student. And these are generally professionals. Most of my students are people who are, you know, late 20s, early 30s, 40s, or older, who, who are either in the middle of their professional careers and they want to learn English to communicate with more people, or they are finished with their professional careers, but they were professional once, and they're enjoying their retirement, learning English to travel. So the what I'm saying is the ages and experience levels of people make for really interesting conversation when you talk about something like a hard nut to crack. Um, one of my older students gave some really good advice, and he's the one who said, look, it's good to be a hard nut sometimes. You have to be stubborn. You have to make your life happen the way you want your life to happen. But if you're a hard nut to crack all the time, people may not try to crack that nut and get to know you very well. So maybe you're slowing down. You're, what's a good word for this? You're delaying or you're hampering. Here's a good word, hampering. I'll put this in the, in the chat here on Twitch. Hampering, this is a word I use a lot. When you're slowing something down, when you slow down a process, you hamper the process. You're hampering your ability to build relationships with these people. So 
Anyway, these are some good idioms. These signal phrases are excellent. If you can start using them in your English, they will improve your English by many degrees because they make you sound natural. They show a strong understanding of the language and they just sound good. Simply put, they just sound good. You can use them in informal situations and you can use them if they're signaling phrases in a lot of professional or more formal situations. As a general rule, I tell my students not to use idioms in formal situations or professional situations unless you know the people you're talking to. Know your audience. If you know these people, you know they'll understand the idiom, you understand how to use it correctly, then idiom use should be fair game. And again, it can make your conversation, it can make your presentations more engaging because it's creative use of the language. So feel free to use these when you feel like it's the right time to use it. All right, everyone, this is bringing us to the end of this weekend's weekly roundup stream here on Twitch. Good to see a couple of you check in. Hope you're doing great. Hope your weeks are good. Please feel free. These will be on Twitch for, what is it, 60 days? And they remove old videos? I believe it's 60 days. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But I also take them and I upload them to YouTube, right? We'll have some shorts eventually when I have more time to go through and create some shorts for Instagram. But YouTube is a great place. You can go to Bridge School Online, Rice JD on YouTube. Um, and you'll see videos from this stream. You'll see some of the gaming videos, some of the other educational videos I've created. I'm still building my content, so there's not a huge amount there yet, but give us a few weeks and a few months, and we'll have plenty of content there to draw from. Again, if you're looking for full-fledged English courses, English at the ready, this is the group I'm working with now, uh, and we have, in my opinion, an excellent program, great students, a really good community that we base, we use Kajabi for our community. So our, our community is based in Kajabi, and it's just a group of fantastic people who are asking questions, learning together. Bridge Gaming, over there again, Bridge Gaming. If you like to play a few video games yourself and you'd like to maybe ask some questions while watching someone play some video games, me, we do a weekend Sea of Thieves and right now we're playing Baldur's Gate. So we do Baldur's Gate and Sea of Thieves, Baldur's Gate Friday night, Sea of Thieves on Saturday night, and a weekend roundup on Sunday night. I might do some weekly roundups in time, but right now I just do not have the time. So, you know, check us out at English at the Ready. Go ahead, make sure you follow. Uh, my follow link's broken for right now. Make sure you follow Bridge Gaming here on Twitch so you can catch up with these English streams. And check us out on Instagram. Check us out on YouTube. Make sure you leave your questions and comments. I like to think I'm very good at getting back to people. If you leave a question, if you leave a comment somewhere, I may not respond right away, but I won't forget it. And I will get to you when I get the chance. But everyone take care. Have a great start to your week. Happy time zone change. And I'll see you guys next weekend. Same time, same place, right here on Twitch. 8.30, maybe 9 o'clock, depending on how the kids go to bed. All right, everyone, take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.